Hello everyone and welcome to Well of Life Bible Training Ministry. My name is Reverend James Sessoms and I'm going to be sharing the last lesson of this course. Course number two, the basics of Bible doctrine. I have had the pleasure of sharing 35 lessons with you and I have really been blessed and I hope you have by allowing uh, me to come into your home or work or wherever you may have been and study these lessons. They have been an uplifting time and I have thoroughly enjoyed them and I know that the Holy Spirit is going to speak to our hearts today as we conclude this series on course number two called uh, The End Times. This is lesson number 35, part three, the second coming. We've been talking about the rapture of the church, the millennial reign of Christ, uh, and now we're going to be talking about the second coming. We know of the terrible judgments that's going to come upon the earth during the seven-year uh, tribulation period in which I pray that no one, no one that is listening to this video will be here during that seven-year period. You have the opportunity, even now, before we even get into this lesson, to ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart. And I pray that you will, because when this tribulation period comes, oh my, oh my, what a terrible time it's going to be for those that are left behind. But before we get into this lesson, let's have a word of prayer and and pray and ask God's blessings upon the uh, lesson today. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would speak to the hearts of your people, minister through your servant. Lord, I just pray that I will be used of God to speak the mind of Christ. Open up the saints' ears. Open up the ears of those that would listen, because, Lord, we're dealing with last days. What a time, O oh God, to be studying about last days. What a time to be studying about the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ. Lord, we don't want to be left behind. I pray, Father God, that the hearts of many will be turned towards you. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. So, uh, in this study, we will see that the second coming of Christ will bring God's plan to its completion. The key verse for this lesson is going to be found in Titus chapter 2 verse 13. It says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I'm looking for that day when the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ shall be caught up and they that remain shall be with him and meet him in the clouds. Hallelujah. I'm waiting for that day. Glory be to God. The introduction to this lesson is the whole Bible tells us about God's plan to restore creation. Sin and death will be put away forever. Isn't that going to be good news? Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire. And all of this will come about when Christ returns to earth and all of his glory and all of his power. Hallelujah. The first time, the first time Christ came to earth was for our salvation. The second time will be to restore creation to God's original purpose and design. Isn't that going to be wonderful? We're going to be talking a little bit about that in this lesson. All of creation is waiting for this day. In Romans 8, chapter 8, verse 19 through 22, it says, For the earth, earnest expectation of the creature, waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Verse 20, For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from 
the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. And then finally, verse 22, for we know, listen to this, for we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. This earth and everything in it and all that God created is groaning, waiting for the redemption, waiting for the restoration, waiting for once again for this earth to be restored back to its original purpose where there is no more sin, there is no more sorrow, there is no more sadness. Satan will be done away with and we will live and reign with Christ forever and ever. Oh man, I can hardly wait for that day. So in this study, we'll look at the final events of the end times. We'll look at these topics. The second coming, the millennial reign of Christ, the resurrection of the dead, the final judgment, and then the eternal state. So let's get right into it. First, we're going to be talking about the second coming. All through the Bible, we read the prophecies that the Lord will come with his saints to judge the wicked. This prophecy will be fulfilled in the second coming of Christ. We have scriptures. In Jude, verse 14 and 15, it reads as follows. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Can you imagine that? Jude was given a revelation by the Holy Spirit to see how ungodly individuals, men and women, would blaspheme, mock, and speak evil of the one who came to give them hope and eternal life. But they have rejected him, just as there are people today rejecting so great a salvation that is in and through Christ Jesus. How can people reject the plan of salvation, the hope that is only found in the person of Jesus Christ eternal life through death, burial, and resurrection. And all we have to do is ask God to forgive us of our sins. We are all sinners saved by grace. But that doesn't give us a license to continue to sin. We don't want to put Christ back on the cross, but we want to live a holy life before him now. We want our life to be an example. We want our light to shine so the world around us may see it and glorify our Heavenly Father. Hallelujah. Isn't that going to be good news? But there are going to be people, even after the rapture, even after the saints are gone, there are going to be people left behind who will continue to deny that there is a Messiah, that there was a Christ, that there was a, a, resur a, a cross, death, and a resurrection. They will continue to deny that. And oh, what a sadness will come upon this earth when the second coming of Christ comes. In Psalms 50, verse 3 through 6, we read, Our God shall come and shall not keep alliance. A fire shall devour before him, and that shall be very temptuous round about him. Verse 4, He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth, that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Verse 6, And the heavens shall declare his 
righteousness, for God is judge himself, Selah. In other words, take time to stop and meditate about what is just being spoken, because it's going to come, folks. It's going to come. There's going to be judgment upon this earth. There's going to be a day when we will stand before God and give account of the things that we have done in this life. Some that will be judged will be judged according to their stewardship and their good works and their love for Christ. And others will be judged because they refuse to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and they shall be damned into eternal damnation, not because it was Christ's will, but because they denied him, and they refused to acknowledge Christ as the Messiah and the Redeemer. In Matthew 16, verse 27, it says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Now we're going to get into a little deeper into that as we go along in these five steps or six steps. In 1 Thessalonians 3.13 it reads, To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. The more we spend time in the presence of God, the more our hearts are established and recognizing and acknowledging without any remorse, without any shame or guilt. Our righteousness is filthy rags, but because of what Christ has done for us, he establishes our love and our covenant with him. He establishes our relationship with him. Even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, with all his saints. Oh, I'm telling you, folks, we have much to rejoice about, and there's coming a day soon when we will see him, and we will see him in all of his glory and his splendor. We've been promised that Christ will return in the same way that he departed. He spoke that to his disciples. In John chapter 14, verse 3, He's speaking to his disciples in verse 3, and he says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, and where I am, there you may be also. Doesn't that make you want to serve Christ? Even in the most difficult hardships and circumstances that life can throw at us, and try to knock us down and beat us down and, and get us to deny him. But blessed is his holy name. He said, if I go, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am there you may be also. Hallelujah. I'm looking for that day. And you can be a part of it. You can be a part of it. Everyone does not have to go to hell. They don't have to go to a hell made for Satan and his angels. We can all participate in a glorious redemption, a glorious time. And I hope and pray that you'll see it and get excited about it and be one of those that are looking, looking for his return. In Acts 1 verse 11, it says, which also said, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. That is a confirmation. I'm telling you, the word of God confirms. It confirms exactly the times and the days that we're living in and the promises that are going to be fulfilled in this holy word that I that I'm reading to you and God has confirmed it and he's going to confirm it again 
And my prayer is that you'll be ready and be a part of it. Hallelujah. The second coming is not the same event as the rapture. And many people get that confused. The rapture takes place when the trumpet sounds. When God looks at his son and says, go get your bride, that is going to be a time when Jesus is going to come back on this earth with a shout, a triumphal shout. And we're going to meet him in the air. We're going to look at that in just a moment. We will be caught up into heaven in the rapture and will then return with Christ at the second coming. So that's why it's so important. The rapture and the second coming are not the same. The second coming will not be secret or hidden like the rapture will be. The Bible says, No man knoweth the day nor the hour when the Son of Man will come. But we just read in the book of John where it says that as you have seen him go, he shall return in, in like manner, in the same manner. He didn't go back to heaven with pomp and, and glitz and glory and fireworks and a parade. No, he went back to heaven. Why? Because he's going to prepare a place for you and I. And when he comes back, the first, when he comes back during the rapture, he's going to come back the same way that he left. Isn't that good? The second coming will not be secret or hidden. It will be seen by all. Christ will return to earth with the saints and the angels to defeat Satan's armies. That's the thing that we will see happen at the second coming. Revelation 1 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? During the tri tribulation period, when all evil and all such terrible and incredible things happen, at the end of that seven-year tribulation period, the second coming of Christ, he's going to come back. And we're going to look at that, and we're going to prove to every denier and naysayer, we're going to show you through the word of God that Christ is coming and he's going to come again to make all the saints, every living saint that was faithful to him will also be ruling with him. In Revelation 19, verses 11 through 15, listen to this. And I saw heaven open and behold a white throne, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Verse 12, the eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And verse 13 says, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Hallelujah. Verse 14, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath, of Almighty God. I'm telling you folks, when the second coming takes place, it won't be like his first coming. His first coming was merciful, gracious and loving, a little baby in a manger who grew up to be a young man, who grew into a man and died on a cross, a cruel and terrible death by the religious and by the unfaithful 
and by those that denied him and mocked at him and said he could save many, but he couldn't save himself. No, he's not coming back that way. The second coming of Christ is going to be just as I read that in Revelation uh, chapter 19, 11 through 15. He's going to come with fierceness and wrath. And he's going to put an end to the reign of Satan upon this earth. And those that denied him and would not accept him. Secondly, now this is number two, the millennial reign. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. Christ will defeat the armies of this world at Armageddon. Satan will be bound for a thousand years. And Christ will set up his righteous reign in Jerusalem. In Revelation 20, we'll see this. Verses 1 through 4. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Verse 2 says, And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Do you hear what I'm saying? For a thousand years during the millennial reign, Satan will be bound, and Christ will set up the kingdom back here on the earth. And verse 3, And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. And we're going to get into that in just a few minutes. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God in which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their right hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. There are going to be some who are going to make it through the tribulation period. I know there's going to be 144,000 Jewish people that will make it through. And I don't know how many others will make it through. It's going to be such a difficult and a tremendous, tumultuous and, and tormenting time. I don't want anyone to face that. I don't know what's going to happen during that time. I don't plan on being here. By the grace of Almighty God and His goodness and His mercy, I plan on being gone. I plan on being caught up in the rapture. I plan on, and my desire and my goal is to tell you that you can be there also. You can know Him. You can know the Word of the living God and the power of Almighty God. You can know the presence of the Holy Spirit that will live and abide in you today if you'll just ask Him to come into your heart. Say, Lord, I'm a sinner and I need saved. I need... I need to repent of my sins. I don't want to go through this terrible time. But there are going to be some that are going to make it. But wouldn't it be wonderful to not have to go through such a difficult time as, as we're going to read about. The reign of Christ will be a direct fulfillment of the prophecy given to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16. And thy house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. The word of God continually brings truth and evidence that there is a beginning, but there also is going to be an end. And it's going to happen. And I believe it's coming upon us even quicker than we can even imagine. We don't have time to play games today, folks. It's not a time to deny Christ. It's not a time to play with your faith in Christ. It's not a time to be a religious person. It's a time to have a right relationship with Christ. Have a right relationship with Him. 
based upon the word of God and the acceptance of what he did for us on the cross when he redeemed us who were sinners in need of a savior. The Old Testament prophets spoke often of this glorious reign of the Messiah on earth. And Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 5, And it shall come to pass in the last days, notice what he said, In the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and the nations shall flow into it. Verse 3, And many shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hucks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they uh, learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. In Micah 4, see how this lesson is continually bringing light to the Old Testament prophets and then bringing it into the New Testament. It's proving itself. It doesn't need to be defended by anyone. The Bible says, let every man be a liar, but let God's word be true. We don't need to defend the word of God. It's so here and real and it's present and it's now and it's living. God breathed upon the word and it became powerful hallelujah and an anointing came with it we don't need to stand and try to judge or figure it all out blessed be almighty god receive the word of the lord today and be saved hallelujah micah chapter 4 verse 1 through 7 but in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the lord shall be established in the top of the mountains and it shall be exalted above the hills and the people shall flow into it second time two times this has been confirmed and many nations shall come and say come and let us go up to the mountain of the lord and to the house of the god of jacob and he will teach us his ways we will walk in his paths, for the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations from afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But listen to what, what verse 4 through verse 6 says. For they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and more shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath spoken it. For all people will walk, everyone in the name of his God. That's a small g. And we will walk in the name of the Lord our God, hallelujah, capital G, forever and ever. There will be those that will continue to worship false gods and false religions and false beliefs. But we will come and walk with the Lord our God. And in that day, saith the Lord, will I assemble her, the body of Christ, that, that halteth, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted, speaking about the, the Israelites, and I will make her that halted a remnant, and her that was cast off a strong nation, and the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth and forevermore. He's going to redeem his chosen people. Oh, people get all offended and upset about God's chosen people. But aren't you glad if you had any 
ability to read and study the Word of God. If you just study the Word of God, you would see that when Israel neglected and rejected the Messiah, we were chosen to be grafted in, wild by nature, but yet God chose to graft us in to the plan of redemption. And now we can be a part of the family of God. It doesn't matter if you're an Israelite, black, white, brown, whatever you, you, wherever you came from, every tribe and nation, we're all one in Christ Jesus. If you'll accept him and believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be a part of this glorious day when the second coming of Christ comes. Hallelujah. Why will Christ reign on the earth? The purpose will be to show what God always intended for man. We're going to once and for all see how God intended for you and I to live peaceably and in re right relationship with the Lord here on this earth. We will see what it means to live in obedience under the righteous reign of Christ. Oh, I pray every day that my life would decrease, but that he would increase. That I wouldn't be jealous or envious or angry or frustrated and allow things to happen that would cause my relationship with Christ and others to be stained. But I want to live a life that is totally in love and in trusting in Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Again, more prophetic truth. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them out of, uh, uh, by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt which my covenant they broke. Although I was a husband unto them, says the Lord. Verse 33 says, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Listen to this now. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. And I'll write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will give their iniquity, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Israel was blinded. They couldn't except that Messiah had come and they rejected him and many of them cried out crucify him but because God cannot lie and because God made a covenant that he cannot break he's going to fulfill these scriptures he made a uh, tablet made of stone and he gave it to Moses. And the children of Israel broke that covenant through disobedience. But the new covenant, the covenant that we're living in today, that covenant was built upon better and more precious promises than that of the old. And he's going to write his word into their hearts as he's written them in our hearts. And we're going to believe and we're going to be with him and we're going to live a blessed life. Satan will be released at the end of the millennial and he will make one final attempt to overthrow God and he will be defeated and he will be punished for eternity. Oh, that day is coming, my friend. Revelation 20, verse 7 through 10, and when the thousand years had expired, Satan shall be bound out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is like the sand of the sea. I looked up that 
uh, that little statement there that said the four corners of the earth. And uh, centuries ago, they considered this to be the four corners of the earth. Africa in the south, America in the west, Asia in the east, and Europe in the north. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven. Hallelujah. That's how quick he's going to destroy the wicked. Those that came from those four corners of the earth to try to defeat with Satan as their leader. He's going to destroy them just like that. The snap of his finger. Fire came down out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And he sh and shall be uh, tormented day and night forever and ever. Point number three, the resurrection of the dead. Now we're getting to wind this thing down. Listen to it. This is where you want to pay attention. We've seen all the tribulation, all the terrible things that are going to happen. The thousand year reign, which is called the millennial reign, the rapture, the second coming. Now we're going to see a picture of what's going to take place in the resurrection of the dead in the final uh, judgment of our works. Prophecies concerning the resurrection are also found in the Old Testament. But these prophecies were not as clear that is why Paul calls this doctrine a mystery. It was not fully revealed in the Old Testament. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51, which is quoted so many, many times throughout history, Behold, I'll show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. Paul said this is a great mystery. It's going to happen. We are going to be changed from this vile body that was full of sin and, and corruption and rebellion, disobedience. We're going to be changed because we've been born again. And God knows those that are his. And we're going to be changed and have and receive a glorious body. In Job 19, verses, uh, I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, it says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting contempt. I don't want to be there. I want to be one of those that are changed in the image and likeness of our God. The Bible describes several different resurrections from the dead. And a lot of people don't want to talk about these things. Because they say, well, they just confuse people. No, the Bible will give you truth. And it will give you wisdom and understanding. And the Holy Spirit will help you to know how to discern these things. Number one, the resurrection of Christ. The resurrection of believers. Number two, and the resurrection of unbelievers. Christ is called the firstborn from the dead because he rose on the third day. We have the promise of the resurrection because of him. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, it says, But now in Christ, now that Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. If you are in Christ Jesus, and you have been a born-again believer, you're going to be made alive with this new body. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are at Christ's coming. Those who have died in Christ will be resurrected at the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says, But I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus Christ 
died and rose again. Listen to me now. Listen very carefully. Even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. That's talking about the saints that have gone on to be with the Lord before he comes back. Verse 15 says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. He's going to raise the dead. Those that, are, that, that believed on his name, and served him faithfully, those are coming out of the graves. For the Lord himself shall ascend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up forever with him in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we be with him forever. Those who have died without Christ will be resurrected for the final judgment. Now, I don't want anybody to go through that, but it's going to happen. And I, I saw a great white throne, him that sat on it, Revelation 20, 11 through 15, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was no found or place found for them. It's going to be a sad day, it's a very sad day. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened where the rubber meets the road. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. It doesn't matter which way you went out of this world, you're going to be brought before God. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. I don't have time to get into all that right now. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Your name must be in that book. Fourthly, the final judgment. Jesus prophesied about the final judgment. He described it as the separation of the sheep and the goats. You see, no man can judge properly. We know them by the fruits they bear only. But in the end, God will separate the sheep from the goats. In Matthew 25, verse 31, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Are you hearing me? And then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father. He's talking about the sheep. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. It is important that we understand what those, what the Bible says about who is judged and how they're judged. It's important because you can believe a lie. Believers will be judged for their stewardship. Unbelievers shall be judged for their sins. Believers will not stand in the final judgment. Our sin was judged at the cross when we accepted Jesus Christ because he paid the price. But the Bible does teach that we will give account of our works. We will be rewarded according to our stewardship. And this will probably happen at the time of the rapture. Unbelievers will stand before the great white throne of God, and they will be judged for their unbelief. The Bible says that someday every knee will bow before Christ. This will be fulfilled at the final judgment. Isaiah 45 says, I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. They're going to confess that there was a Christ. One day, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess 
that he was real and that every word he said was true. And then finally, the eternal state. The Lord will create a new heaven and a new earth. After everything is done and over with, we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth. There will be no more sorrow, no more tears, no more death. Revelation 21 says, First one I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth would pass away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from the God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, he that dwell in them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. God shall wipe away all tears from the eyes, and there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have all passed away. Hallelujah. I'm telling you what, what a glorious day that's going to be. So as we wrap this up, many Christians love to study prophecy, but some study it for the wrong reasons. God didn't give us this prophecy to satisfy our curiosity. What then is his purpose? we see that God is faithful and just. We are comforted by the word of prophecy and we are to be purified as we watch and wait for his return. Hallelujah. I'm telling you what, I've had such an awesome time today. I, I, I had to skip over some of it because I got so excited about what I was talking about earlier. But the truth of it all is, is that there is coming a day and we all need to be ready and prepared. And that's my prayer for you today. Get ready. Be ready for Jesus is coming soon. Do you believe that? I believe it. Thank you for the opportunity to share these 35 lessons. I pray that they've been an inspiration to you as they have been to me. And I thank you for the opportunity. Support well of Life Bible Training Ministry. What an awesome ministry it is. I know that Reverend Charles Sessoms and Yanni Sessoms and all the team members that are working day and night, doing some incredible things all over the world, they would be honored for you to team up with them. God bless you, and may the Lord be with you, and may you be with the Lord at his appearing. Hallelujah. God bless.